Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight for a presentation on getting your garden ready for the winter. My name is Anissa Luckman and I'll be your moderator for tonight. This is the first webinar of a four part fall webinar series taking place at 7 p.m. on select weeknights in se September, October and November. These are hosted by the Durham Environmental Advisory Committee, otherwise known as DIAC, which is a council appointed citizen committee of volunteers who are dedicated to promoting community outreach and stewardship through various activities and projects to support environmental awareness and appreciation in the region, including educational opportunities such as these. Now, before we turn it to our program for tonight, just a quick housekeeping note, please use the chat Q&A function during the presentation for any questions you have for our presenters, and we'll make sure that those get answered at the very end of the presentation. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speakers for the evening. Pam Clark has been an active member of the Durham Master Gardeners for over 14 years and has served for many years on the board of the Master Gardeners of Ontario. Pam has a horticultural certificate from the University of Guelph. She describes herself as a generalist gardener. Following a long banking career, Pam gained practical gardening experience operating her own gardening service business services business until 2014 and now Pam concentrates on sharing her gardening knowledge and finding ways to enjoy and make her garden easy to manage. Our second, our, excuse me, our second speaker for tonight, Roman, is a new master gardener in training. He spent four years completing a Bachelor of Landscape Architecture in Poland and graduated from Poznan University of Live Sciences in 2012. In addition, he continued his education in Canada for two more years and graduated from Durham College with an honors as a horticultural technician in 2015. Studying and designing human natural living space has been Roman's passion for over a decade. He currently works for the City of Toronto as a gardener. I will now pass it over to Roman to start the presentation for the evening. You're on mute, Roman. I think I got it now. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, OK, I'm just going to share my screen now. There we go. Um, can you see the screen? Yes, we can. Perfect. OK, let's start. Uh, welcome everybody, uh, Durham Master Gardeners. Um, we're very happy to be here, Pam Clark and uh, Roman, myself. Uh, let's start. Do I have to be a master to join? No, you don't have to be a master gardener to join at all. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm a master gardener in training and we welcome everybody. Uh, winter, it's coming soon. <laughs> it's there. Uh, okay, so uh, what we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about uh, putting garden to bed, of course, but why do we do it? Why why do we put garden to bed to begin with? Uh, there are several reasons. Uh, we'll focus on each and every single one of them. And uh, after completing this um, course, <laughs> your garden is going to look like this, just like the tree you can see. No, I'm just kidding. OK, so why do we put garden to bed? Uh, aesthetical purposes, uh, basically, what we want to do, we want to make sure the garden looks nice, uh, but do we do it because our neighbor did it across the road? No, no, there is science behind it and we'll focus on uh, the science behind it. Uh, for aesthetic purposes, due to aesthetic purposes, we want to make sure we remove all the yellow, soggy, dirty looking leaves such as um, hostas, they turn yellow daylilies, um, irises, uh, we call them herpetious perennials, herpetious perennials. Uh, and the reason for which they're called herpetious perennials is the fact that they do not grow wood, such as other plants, such as uh, hydrangea or uh, butterfly bush, dogwood, they do, they do become woody. Um, okay, so number one, aesthetics. Number two, uh, why do we even bother putting garden to bed? Well, we want to make sure we do a thorough cleanup and the reason for this is the fact that some of the plants in our garden, some of the trees on the street are infested or infected. 
Uh, when we talk about infestation, we talk about insects attacking our plants. When we talk about an infection, we're talking about diseases attacking our plants. And there are three different types, viral, bacterial, and fungal diseases. 90% of the diseases you will see in the garden, uh, they are basically fungal diseases. It's fungus that, that attacks uh, trees and shrubs and herbaceous perennials we do love and we do plant in our gardens. So why do we bother removing such leaves? For example, the one you see in the picture, uh, it's a maple leaf and infected with uh, fungal disease. Pam will tell you more about uh, um, leaf collection. Uh, what I wanted to talk about tonight is inocula, singular inocula, uh, singular inoculum, plural inocula, uh, so what is this? Inocula is any part of a pathogen that will survive over winter and reinfect the plant again, and it will be happening over and over again every single season if we do not clean up thoroughly. Uh, so what's happening? We have an overwintering inoculum, such as a spore uh, from a fungus that infected a plant, uh, and it becomes a source of a primary infection, and it usually happens in the spring. Uh, what's happening next, uh, it penetrates the vessels in, in the tissue of a plant and it grows and it blooms, believe it or not, fungus blooms too, and it creates a fruit and a fruiting body, we call it the fruiting body, and it releases, releases a spore into the air and uh, it becomes a source of a secondary infection. We call it a secondary inoculum and a disease progresses over and over again and this cycle will never be broken if we do a leaf infected a leaves in the garden. And for this reason, we do a thorough cleanup. We do put the garden to bed. Um, okay, next one. Uh, why do we bother putting garden to bed? We want to tidy up woody perennials. So woody perennials, uh, I'm gonna focus on this one for a while. Woody perennials are the ones that grow back every year. However, they do grow wood. They don't die back. They just become dormant. Uh, we want to tidy, tidy them up. So how do we do it? How do we tidy up woody perennials? Uh, we removed diseased branches. Uh, you will notice if they're diseased, there will be powdery mildew on it. Uh, they will be coated in a funny uh, substance. It, sometimes it's black, sometimes it's white. Uh, they just don't look natural. They don't look the same as other branches on the tree or a shrub or, or any other woody perennial. We want to cut them out. Uh, in addition, in order to remove the air re remove the blockage and improve the airflow uh, we want to make sure we remove all the, the all the branches that basically touch each other on the inside they grow inwards instead of outwards uh, that's what we want to do so we tidy them up remove all the leaves from around the base of the plant and remove all the twigs that are broken damaged to disease that's pretty much what it is tidy up your woody perennials that's why we do it um, why do we put garden to bed again? There's another reason we shape plants that bloom on new wood. Uh, and that raises a question. Is there another type of plants that blooms on another type of wood? The answer is yes. There are two different types of plants. One of them blooms on new wood, another one. In this particular case, we're talking about the plants that do bloom on a new wood. So for what are the examples? A new wood. Um, Panicle hydrangea, for example, there are many, many different types of hydrangeas. Not all of them bloom on new wood, this one particular, and that's actually uh, the one that's in the picture. No, sorry, that's a different type. Uh, butterfly bush, dogwood, burning, uh, burning bush, uh, snowberry, all of those plants do grow flowers on new wood. Um, so why are we talking about shaping plants that bloom on new wood? Well, if we're talking about putting garden to bed, which usually happens at the end of the season and the fall, uh, everybody would love to cut something. And th the thing is, if we start cutting plants that bloom on old wood at this time of the year, they're not going to bloom next year. So we can only cut those that do bloom on new wood. And for this reason, you're seeing this slide. So we can shape plants that bloom on new wood in the fall. All right. Um, before we talk about preserving evergreens, I just want to go back here. There we go. Can we shape plants that bloom on new on old wood? The answer is yes. We can shape them, but we don't do it in the fall. And the reason for this is the fact that if we do remove the flower buds uh, located on the stems, 
we also remove flowers. For example, uh, azaleas, forsythia, lilacs, uh, plums and cherries, all, all, all the whole family of those plants uh, blooms on old wood and um, honeysuckle or uh, uh, vigella, some people call it vigilia. Uh, blooming spireas that bloom uh, at the end of spring and beginning of summer, the same thing. Uh, that's what we want to do. We can shape them, we can prove them. The answer is yes. However, we have to do it right after they finish blooming. We can't wait until the end of the season. Uh, off to the next one. Why do we put garden to bed? Here is another reason to preserve evergreens, to preserve evergreens. Um, so why do we preserve evergreens? Is there anything particularly happening to those evergreens for which uh, and for, uh, do we have to really preserve them? The answer is yes, we do have to preserve them. Um, how does it happen? Um, it happens because evergreens as opposed to deciduous trees, shrubs, do not go dormant. They do slow their life biochemical processes. They do slow them down uh, to bare minimum, but they do not go dormant. And here is here is why. Uh, it happens because those plants constantly move water around the stems and the roots that comes out through their leaves. We call it a constant upward move them, movement of water and as water exits through the leaves, through the scales and needles in this case, as you can see in the picture, we call it uh, we call it transpiration. You will see a, a zoom picture of stomata on leaves and, 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 and scales and needles too. Um, you'll be able to see it and, and learn how and why it happens. As a result, because we want to preserve evergreens, uh, we want to slow down that upward movement of water. So what does it mean that water flows upwards, <laughs> goes up? Why? How? Well, what happens, your roots that are sitting in the ground in the root bowl, they take up water, which is then transported to the crown or the main stem or the main trunk, the main leader sometimes. And evergreens, you will hear a lot of the word main leader. It goes up and it uh, it's evenly distributed all over the branches and the needles and the scales and exits through the holes and the scales and needles into the air and uh, we have to slow it down in winter. So after the next slide, types of freezing, the reason for which you see this slide is to just to signal it to you, show it to you, uh, show it to you that there are two types of freezing. Intracellular happens, water freezes inside the cells. You don't have to memorize it, learn it, nothing like that. And there is a second type, extracellular, that's where the water particles um, they freeze between the cells. Uh, Pam told me yesterday I should only quickly mention the two types. Don't don't get into details. So I want what I want to say though. Only one of those types will kill your plants, and is the intracellular type of freezing. If it happens, unfortunately, uh, the cells will rupture and 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 they will be dead. The plant will die. Okay. Uh, next slide. Why don't evergreens go dormant? So, so, so many plants do, deciduous plants do. Um, and here's the picture on the left hand side. You can see boxwood. It's an example of uh, uh, of an evergreen. And on the right hand side, uh, you have um, a service berry. It's an example of a deciduous plant. But what's the difference? Just by looking at the picture, we can tell the color. The one on the left, which is boxwood, is green. The one on the right, which is service berry, is red, probably getting ready to drop leaves. And uh, they do drop leaves because of the evolutionary adaptation. We call it evolutionary ad adaptation. So they adapted evolutionary to, to different strategies to survive winter. Leaves are very, very economically expensive. Takes a lot of biochemicals and energy movement around the plant to maintain them in winter. So the deciduous type decided to just get rid of them. When the hard times come, we save money. When hard times come, Plants save sugar. In this case, I should call it carbohydrates. That, that, that's the technical name. And they do save water. And uh, in order to survive, they save, save, save. So this process of losing leaves is called the abscission. It's basically...
All right, it looks like our presenter is having some technical difficulties. Um, so we'll just wait for him to reconnect. In the meantime, Pam, is there anything you would like to potentially fill in? Fill in, in OK. OK, unfortunately, he, he's got the presentation over there, so um, this is embarrassing, but uh, I only have my part, so um, I can try to pull it up. Hold, hold on, I'll pull it up on my screen and then maybe I can share where he was. Sure. Okay, so <laughs> all right, I have it on my desktop, but I'm not sure how to share it. All right, so if you look on the top right hand corner, there's a square that has an arrow pointing upwards. That's your share button. Okay, so if you click on that and then select the window that you would like to share. And if you click on a window, all the windows that you have open on your computer will point pop up. Click on window. So once you click on the share button. OK, I did that. OK, now I see them down at the bottom. Yes, so okay. that's the window that you'd like to share and it should pop up. OK. Is it there? Yes, it is. Let's have IT shift it to your screen. I'm going to set it up with so you can just see the slides. Okay. Can you see that? Yes, we can. OK, so um, all right. I'm going to do my best here. This is a picture of uh, Roman was talking about the different uh, ways conifers and evergreens react to the cold. And on the right, we have a real, real microscopic close up of the stomata on a maple leaf. And on the left, it's one of the um, a, an evergreen um, stomata from a spruce. And you can see how much bigger the ones on the right are so that they're more, um, well, the ones on the left, the uh, spruce are more protected from the cold for that reason. Okay. So another reason we want to protect our evergreens in winter is because of the wind. Um, the, uh, the winds can be very 
fierce, uh, especially a lot of our winds come from the northwest in uh, our area. So protecting them from the extra uh, cold it inflicts from the winds is important. Also, in a way, protecting them from damage just uh, from the wind itself. So Roman talked about transpiration. This is a real good close up of a pine needle and how they ongoing through the winter, they are transpiring or giving off moisture. So that's one of the reasons uh, if you're planting a new evergreen or have existing evergreens uh, to make sure you water them really well and deeply up until freeze up. So they'll have be able to store that supply of extra water in the roots. Uh, this is a, a chemical picture of how the transpiration works. So one of the things you can do to slow it down is use um, burlap and it can be used in several different ways. Um, another thing you can do is put these guards around the trees and fill them with um, with leaves. Uh, you can see on the left, on the right, this is, I would say, deer proofing here. <laughs> they've gone, they've got these fenced up about seven feet, so that would be good to protect a new tree from the deer. Lower down, you'll also see a cone on the tree. So the, um, that, if you weren't, if you didn't have a deer problem, but let's say you had a rabbit problem, especially on a new, newer, younger trees, you can get these uh, wraparound things that uh, they can go up oh, two and a half feet, depending if we get a lot of snow. And it just uh, stops like mice and rabbits from chewing on the bark. You want to really want to protect the bark on a new tree. So here on, on the left here is an example of that wraparound. Um, and you can see a little bit closer here in the middle shot, the, um, it's got holes in it, so it's ventilated. Um, and you can, um, so the tree can breathe. It also protects new trees a lot, uh, sometimes on the southern exposure of trees in winter, they can get sun scald or they can, due to the freeze and thaw, the, the bark may crack a bit. So this is a way to protect new trees from that happening. The example on the right is, um, again, more for deer and rabbits, things like that. It's a, it's a hard wire and it's um, so they won't be chewing on the bark of your tree. So these are just some uh, examples of, uh, of the different kinds of ever evergreens, sorry. And uh, so we've got some cypress here, some juniper, um, some yew, um, different kinds of pines. And so these are all benefit from the, a, good, um, a good watering before freeze up. One of the ways that's recommended to do it, if you have access to a garden hose near your evergreens, is to just put it on small and then it would uh, like a trickle and let it trickle for a couple of hours. And that will make the water, instead of just running off, it'll soak really down in. So we're getting a rainfall tomorrow, but depending on our winters, we could have hot, sunny, who knows these days, right? So um, once it's gonna start and tell us it's gonna freeze and have frost, that's when you really gotta be alert to, to the extra watering. Here's some things you can do with burlap. You can put these poles um, around your pyramidal evergreens and then wrap it with burlap. You may want to tie it with a string or use clothes pegs. Uh, anything like that will just keep that in place. This is also a good technique, not only for newly planted, but if you do have evergreens along the side of your driveway or near the roadway that might get salt spray, this is a way to protect them from that. On the left here, um, you'll see that this uh, this tree is close to, to close to the house. It's maybe uh, you can't tell from the top, but it could be under an eave. So uh, one of the suggestions here, there, there can be a problem with the snow falling off your house and onto your evergreens. 
So particularly when they get bigger, uh, they have like more than one leader. You can't always see that, but they do. So putting a string around it kind of keeps it all together, nice and cozy. So if there is a snowfall off the off the roof, it helps uh, protect them and stops the branches from breaking. Also, if we get a freezing rain, uh, it offers that protection as well. Uh, this is another, these are you, uh, which a lot of people have these along the front of their house. And this specifically was designed to stop um, ice falling off the eaves. Um, so it'll, it will fall off the eaves when it warms up and the snow, but it'll hit this platform and, um, and that will take most of the, the brunt of the fall of the ice and the weight of the snow. This is another little cute design. <laughs> this is made from uh, uh, a fence. Like uh, I've seen this fence and farmers use this fence or snow fence, that's what it's called. And uh, so what uh, they had access to snow fence, they've made like a, a cubicle and put some stakes in the corner and wrapped it with burlap to protect, protect one of their favorite trees. You can see this is really out in the open. So it would be a windy site probably. And they, that's why they're doing a bit of extra protection. Uh, this is another idea. They kind of made these screens with the, the front would be facing uh, the direction that they get the wind on their, on their property. And uh, so it just breaks some of that, that coldness and stops the transpiration. These are some other things specifically, if you've, especially if you've got like individual herbs, uh, herbs, <laughs> individual evergreens across the front of your home. Uh, then you can purchase these covers and uh, they just sit on them. I would uh, maybe put some mulch around them to keep them down until the, the, um, the freeze comes or if we get enough snow, they'll, they'll eventually stay in, their, stay in their own place. Okay, so back to cleaning up. Um, what are we going to clean up? Uh, October is a great time to start your uh, cleanup after we've had one or two hard frosts. It's a little early now and I noticed in my own garden the birds are still busy pecking around at the different flowers and the seed head. So uh, by, the, uh, by the time October comes and we've had a couple of good frosts, again depending on the year, the trees will start losing their leaves, so it's a good time to start the cleanup of your flower garden, for instance. How much you do actually depends on what your preference is for the look. Um, it used to be we had the scorched earth look where everything was cut down to the bottom and left, and uh, it's not very attractive for winter, <laughs> and it's not very uh, helpful for our little insects, such as the bees and other uh, bugs that overwinter in the soil or over uh, winter in a hollow stem of your uh, one of your flocks plants for instance or some of your grasses it's a good place for them to hide for the winter. It also depends on your schedule so you might be less busy in the spring um, so do your cleanup in the fall or vice versa and it also depends on how much you want to leave for um, animals and birds and insects in the habitat. This is how one of our gardeners leaves her, win her uh, garden in winter. So you can see here, there's brown-eyed Susans on the left. She's got different grasses at the front and some reeds and other, um, uh, like a coneflower at the back and tall grasses. So she leaves this like this until the spring. It's actually, I've seen it in the winter as well. It's very beautiful. And she has lots of birds, uh, lots of birds there all winter. So if anybody uh, has roses, um, there's a lot of new roses on the market uh, too. And there's some of the Canadian series that are, are extremely hardy down to 40 below. And the main thing to do with roses has to do with the, um, the union, the graft. Most root roses are grafted onto a rootstock. And so now the new science is to plant that rootstock in our area so the graft is six to eight inches between ground below the ground level. And if you do that, you don't have to mulch. So uh, that's one good thing. 
if you um, happen to have, um, um, you don't need to hill it up, that's what I meant, not mulch necessarily. If they're not planted deeply, then you should add, um, you should hill them up and you can hill them up using things like triple mix, uh, compost, a manure, garden soil, um, things like that to at least eight inches up the stems and uh, then compact the hill down uh, gently with your foot all the way around. If you have hybrid teas or Florabunda or Grandiflora, you can cut the bushes back to about 18 inches. For shrub roses, you can cut, cut those back to about two feet. And um, also this is a time to look if you've got some dead branches or really skinny scrawny ones, you could prune those out. Uh, now as well. A rugosa, rugosa, they're pretty pretty hardy. The only thing I would really do with those is if there's anything damaged or you see, um, oh, I guess damage would be the main thing or some kind of disease on the stalks. Uh, otherwise you can leave those alone. On the right hand side is a picture of the um, uh, what to do with a climber. So my climbers right through, oh, I guess in August, they decided to put out these 10 foot shoots way out to the sides. And uh, so I am leaving those for this year because they're new. But uh, some of the old ones that I had sent up uh, what they call lateral shoots. So those are the shoots that come up the top of those long stems. And some of them get quite long, so we should uh, trim those back. Uh, to about six inches from that main stem that's going out to the side. The other thing with climbers is uh, because they're long branches, they can get whipped around in the winter wind. Uh, so it's a good idea to secure them to something, whether you have, hopefully you have some kind of arbor or um, it could, if they're along your fence, it could be along your fence rail or along your deck. So secure them in some way such as that against the winter wind. This is another thing you can purchase um, if you need to, instead of healing, you can use these. Um, they, are, uh, they are made of styrofoam and uh, uh, the thing to do to make sure with these is that there's a good seal between the ground level and um, the the cone. So you could do that perhaps by putting some mulch around there or a bit of garden soil and tap it down. Just uh, you want to make sure there's the cold air is not getting in there until we have a snowfall. So depending on when we get a snowfall this year, that could be a few months from now. So you want to that would um, that would give you a good seal if you uh, put that extra mulch around there. So now everybody's favorite topic, I've fallen for you, fall leaves are so beautiful. But they are a work. <laughs> so if you have lots of leaves or lots of, uh, lots of deciduous trees or your neighbor has lots of deciduous trees, you could end up with quite a few of these in your yard. Uh, the first year I got to tell you this little story quickly. When I moved into my new house, I, I'm uh, with small bungalows on a street and my one neighbor, when one leaf fell, she went out and picked it up. But the neighbor two doors up, he didn't do anything. I was talk. I said to him, what's the leaf etiquette around here? He says, oh, I just wait for the wind. <laughs> so that's how he handled it. But uh, I must admit, I do something with my leaves. Um, so good to rake them before snowfall. Uh, particularly get them off your lawn. So the leaves can compact on your lawn and snow mold can grow in there over the winter. And the result will be dead patches in your lawn in spring. So a really good reason to get them off your lawn. Um, so Roman talked about uh, black spot or tar spot being a fungus. So these are, um, my neighbor has these on his tree across the street, so I get some in my yard. Those I put in the municipal compost because um, I don't want to recycle them onto my yard. So, and the municipal compost, um, they have such a large amount in the way their composting works, it gets really, really hot, which will kill the fungus. So anything like um, 
down the mildew that you get on your roses and on your flocks, put those leaves in a separate container and put them in the city um, compost. So you can bag them, you can vacuum them, you can blow them around. Um, I find that um, I had one of these small uh, things like this lady has that blows and also vacuums up the leaves. I found because I have nut trees around me and twigs, uh, they kept getting jammed in the motor. So I didn't use that very often, um, but I tend to uh, use something else instead. So this is what we've started doing at our house with the lawnmower on the left. Uh, I get my husband to run over the leaves on the front yard, uh, maybe rake them into some small hills, and then he runs over them back and forth, back and forth, back and forth until they're really, really fine. And that is my fertilizer for my lawn next year. Um, if I have a lot, I'll move them into the driveway and run over them, get, run over them there and use that shredded mulch. I may not do it as finely there because they're not staying on the, um, they're not staying on the lawn. Um, so anyway, um, you get something that looks like this picture on the right after you do it, and this would be excellent mulch. So this is all I've been using for mulch in my garden uh, because I do have a couple of maple trees on our street and uh, another tree in the backyard that provides me with some leaves that I can uh, do this with. So why would we, I just want to talk about mulching. It's one of the best things you can do for your garden. Um, it, and uh, especially um, once it freezes, then it's a good time to put the mulch down. Uh, and that freeze thaw cycle, that is a good reason. It's like putting a blanket on your garden. The snow coming too is like putting a blanket on your garden if we get enough sm snow to do that. Um, so this just helps, especially in the spring, it moderates the temperature, it retains moisture, so you don't get your plants heaving and, and dry, drying out. And so what you can use for mulch, obviously the leaves off your trees. I just want to mention oak leaves, they stay, uh, they're a little more dense, so they're harder to chop up and, uh, but they do tend to stay dry. Um, maple leaves, of course, and other deciduous trees. If you have any aged sawdust or conifer branches, some people use that and put it around their, their garden and that will trap the snow and act as a mulch. Uh, and arborist wood chips, those are the, I guess, the next most popular kind of mulch. So you can do all those things for mulch, or you could make this, which is, we call it gardener's gold, or also known as leaf mold. And uh, it is made from composted uh, deciduous leaves. So how do you do that, you may ask? <laughs> well, these are a couple of ways. I'm sure there's other ones, but uh, I like this bag method. So uh, dark garbage bag, uh, fill it with leaves, not really, really tightly, but substantially full, as you can see from, from these here. Add in a uh, half a cup of a high nitrogen fertilizer. So when we talk about fertilizer, you'll see on the bag three numbers. So it could be like a general, uh, fertilizer is 10, 10, 10. So what does that mean? So the first 10 stands for nitrogen, the second 10 is phosphorus, and the third 10 is potassium. Those are the main things your plants need uh, for healthy growth. And a lot of times they get it out of the soil, but we can supplement it with fertilizer. Um, so you're going to put a half a cup of a, uh, one with a high first number in the bag, a couple shovelfuls, you could put a couple of shovelfuls of manure if you have it, uh, and a couple of shovelfuls of uh, garden soil. So the garden soil provides the microbes that you need to, that will digest these uh, to the leaves, and a liter of water. So you put that in, mix it up, stick it in behind your hedge or along your fence. You may want to turn it upside down uh, before it gets frozen into the ground and, and early in spring if you can move them around. You might want to right, want to do that. And um, oh, I, I don't think I mentioned poke a couple of holes, so maybe ten holes around in the bag, so moisture and air can uh, get out. Uh, it usually takes between six and twelve months for this to break down, and it can break down faster if you were storing it in an unheated garage if you have room. Um, on the right hand side, you can actually do a similar thing. 
in a, com a three bin composting system. You'll see the dry leaves on the left. Um, and usually it works, there's dry, wet, and then the combo. So you layer a layer of dry, a layer of wet things, could be like your kitchen scraps, um, things like that. Uh, leaves you pruned off your carrots or whatever, and uh, then uh, you turn it per periodically. So lawns. So lawns. <laughs> There's a big movement towards uh, no mow lawns, which means replacing them, or replacing them with uh, native plants. Uh, other, uh, some people are replacing them with their vegetable garden. So, uh, but a lot of people still have some lawn, even though they may be reducing it um, somewhat. So, what can you do for your lawn in the um, in the to get ready for winter? Reseeding September is probably the best month of the year to do reseeding. Uh, once we get into October, the grass starts to the growth starts to slow down. So, this is a good time to. Um, reseed, um, put a, a top dress it with a small amount of compost or topsoil or um, uh, well those are the main two I guess you could put down uh, and then put your seed on top of that. You need to remember to uh, water it if we don't get rain uh, you need to remember uh, to water it uh, and keep it so keep the area moist. Um, the other thing you can do at this time of year, if if your lawn is looking a little tired, I don't know if it would work on this one, but it, it may eventually, is to apply a high phosphorus. So phosphorus is the middle number uh, fertilizer that encourages root growth and it also greens up more quickly in the spring. The um, uh, the best time to do that, though, is late October or November. So you can uh, you can wait a bit to do that. Um, should keep watering overall if you're not doing any of those other things um, and cutting as long as the grass is growing and continue to mow your lawn up until frost. The last cut before winter should be maybe two to three inches high, uh, so a bit shorter than uh, normal. And uh, one of the ideas is to mow the edge of your lawn a couple of times so it just tidies it up because you're going to be looking at that bare edge all through uh, a lot of the winter. So it's nice to have it look, uh, look neat and tidy. Okay, so these are, this is kind of getting back to your perennial garden and what to cut back. So um, we talked about this a little bit already. So leaving seed pods and flower heads for winter interest, as well as for the birds. So things that are ideal for this are a still bee, uh, some grasses, sedums, uh, black eyed Susans, purple cone, cone flower is a favorite. Uh, but I got to tell you, some of these are, um, uh, some of the, well, they will. If the birds don't get them, they'll fall into your garden and they'll grow into new plants. So some plants are more plentiful with their seed sharing. Uh, we call them uh, friendlies. So you may have a lot of friendlies in the garden. So uh, it, it, you have to temper that with what you're willing to put up with. I have some globe thistles. The birds absolutely love them, but they tend to eat them later on. So I do cut some of those down. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to have 100 uh, globe thistles next spring, which uh, which I don't have room for in my small garden. Um, so do not cut back uh, sub shrubs. So we talked a bit about shrubs. So things like lavender, uh, Russian sage, uh, let's see, uh, bluebeard, thyme, the oreganos, um, say, um, I think sages. Um, so those uh, do not cut back at this time of year. Just leave those. I took some cuttings from my lavender today, just the stem with that. I don't know why I got blooms on there. So anyway, uh, I cut those off. I'm going to uh, to dry those and keep them for winter. Uh, if you haven't already done so, this is a good time to harvest seeds. Uh, if you want to start some new plants indoors next year or start them in a new area of your garden, um, it's a good time to do that. Also a good time to harvest some of your herbs if you haven't already done so. I've uh, still got some um, 
sage and some oregano that I want to clip and, and hang to dry. Um, do not cut back. Um, Oh, I'm sorry, do. <laughs> These are some you should cut back. Um, lilies, daylilies, uh, peonies. So the peonies are ones that like to get that powdery mildew. So put those leaves in the, in the city uh, waste. Uh, hosta, uh, daylily. So remove anything that's going to uh, go mushy, um, dark, um, mushy or dark. So these are some annual beds that have been uh, uh, hit by frost, and uh, they can be they can be left all winter if you want. Um, again, I think the thing with the seeds, uh, you can harvest them or just cut the seed heads off if you like the look of them in your uh, garden. If you do um, want to compost them, make sure they don't have any disease on them or put the disease ones in the city compost. Um, you can cut things like marigolds. I cut the top off, but I leave the root in the ground. So the roots, I think it's like petunias, I do the same with those. So the roots, they're not that big or thick a root system that they will decompose and add uh, nutrients to your soil. So I, I like to do that. Also the annuals, I like to start my own marigolds. So I'll take some of the seed pods off of those uh, to start them. We do have some annuals that are um, almost like a tender perennial that you can leave out. You can see in the back of the picture on the right, a plant called Dusty Miller. It's got a beautiful uh, gray silver leaf and quite often that's come back the next year in my garden. Uh, pansies uh, will do the same thing and um, snapdragons too can do the same thing and come back uh, the next year. So this is the time if you have things like um, uh, geraniums, impatiens, uh, fibrous magonias, um, any non hardy ornamental grasses. So this is a time where you can take some cuttings. Some people do try to bring them in, but I find that um, uh, well, what I've heard is that they, they don't do so well over winter. Maybe uh, geraniums is the one exception. Some people bring the whole plant in and leave it in their windowsill. Other people will take cuttings or they cut it back severely and store it in a pot um, in a cool, dry place. Uh, that's worked for me. Doing the cuttings worked for me as well. Um, so those are things you can do for those type of annuals. Uh, on the right hand side here, you'll see um, what happens to the beautiful cannas once we get a frost. They do not look so pretty. So uh, these are ones, some of these can be very expensive, uh, but they can be overwintered and you can replant them next year. So once they get hit by a frost like this, um, cut off the stalks and, um, and get rid of the stalks. And so it may, it may take a couple of hard frosts before this to happen. Then lift them out if you can, or gently with a fork, dig them out. Shake as much dirt uh, or soil off them as you can. It's a good idea if you have a hose uh, to wash them off and get as much soil off them um, as you can. And then um, sit them to dry. So I sit mine on my back steps um, on a sunny day and eventually over a week or so they dry. I do bring them in if it's going to rain. Uh, I do bring them in actually in the evening because of the heavy dew we're getting this time of year. Um, so I do that. You, you can dry them other places, but I tend to do it there. Um, then you want to store them someplace cool and dark and dry for the winter. So some people will use brown bags, uh, big brown like the yard waste bags. They will store them in there with some peat moss or some sawdust. Um, other people um, use plastic containers. The thing with plastic, you don't want to seal it up. So if you can make holes in them, uh, holes in the lids, some holes in the side for ventilation. Um, other people use cardboard boxes, like a sturdy cardboard box. Uh, last year I experimented, I just used some of my plastic flower pots that are about 18 inches high. I put a layer of um, 
Uh, I've been doing a lot of shredding on my documents. I don't know why, I guess with cleaning during COVID and I had a lot of shredded paper. So I put the shredded paper in the bottom, then the dried bulbs and another layer and another layer and topped it off with shredded paper and just stored them downstairs in uh, a room that's pretty uh, cool. Uh, you need to check them periodically. I would say monthly just to be sure uh, to see if there's any signs of rot or mold developing. You want to cut those out or throw them away. Um, also, later on towards the spring, I'd say January or February, they might, might be getting really dry. So I would look at them and maybe spritz them lightly um, with uh, some a water spritzer. Um, the other thing you're picking, doing now, if you've still got lots of tomatoes before the frost, though, uh, you can harvest your green tomatoes and um, store them in a cardboard tray or something like that. Some people wrap them in newspaper and they will eventually uh, ripen and you can use them well after uh, well after the frost is hit. If you're growing garlic or onions, you may have already harvested that. You can could tell about harvesting that when uh, the stalks have all died down. Uh, so lift them out, let them dry again in a cool dark place and uh, you can store them for the winter. So doing stuff for winter can also mean thinking about what you're going to do in spring. So this is a, a picture I just want to share briefly about making if you run out of room like I have but I don't have much room to make a new bed here. Uh, this is a no dig way of making a bed. So maybe, uh, basically it started with four inches of mulch on top of the grass and then another uh, six, eight, six to eight inches deep of uh, soil on top of that. So depending on what you're growing, you can get uh, different soils from our um, our garden centers or soil supply companies, they can, they're can they really good at, uh, you tell them what you want to grow, they can recommend something for you, depending on your budget too, there's different price points. Uh, as long as you do, I do recommend you get something with a topsoil base. Um, so this will compact over winter and by next spring, the grass will have died and you'll be able to just uh, direct plant. So how many people have been to the garden center sales? <laughs> yes, I have, I was on Saturday. I don't know where I'm gonna put them, but this is a good time to uh, um, go shopping. I guess that's the simplest way uh, I can say this. Um, so you want to um, look, they have, I know they have perennials, I saw them. The perennials and shrubs particularly are on sale. So you can save some money and get some bargains as well. So the other thing they have there is, um, I don't know if you can read the top of this. It says, oh, yes, you can. Squirrel proofing. So the other thing at this time of year, getting ready for winter in the vein of getting ready for spring is to plant, plant bulbs. And depending where you are, you may have uh, challenges with different critters in your garden, uh, particularly I'm in Oshawa here. We have lots of squirrels and chipmunks. Um, and they're, they're really the ones that give you some... Uh, angst in the fall. So what can you do in the fall uh, to protect your bulbs, your spring bulbs? Um, when you are digging the hole, one of the things you can do is overlay it with chicken wire um, or some people use boards like a deck board. They'll put that over where they planted the bulbs and um, the squirrels tend not to go after those because uh, they're basically lazy. And uh, but once it freezes, especially the boards, you can just lift them up so they, you don't have to have ugly boards on your garden all winter. Um, I've been using chicken grit. It's like a crushed um, it looks like a crushed stone. I don't really know what it's made of, but I got it from the co-op in uh, Orno. And I put that when I plant my bulbs and I'll put some soil an inch below the surface soil, I'll put an inch of chicken grit in the hole where I have the bulbs, then top it up with soil. Um, the other thing you can do is plant bulbs that squirrels tend not to like and other uh, critters tend not to like as well. So what are they? Things like uh, crocus, uh, allium, those are the um, tall ones with the, they remember the onion family, they get the beautiful bulbs up at the top, on the top. Um, 
Frutillaria, they've got, um, they're the ones that kind of dangle down. They smell like a skunk, so they tend to stay away from those. Uh, anything related to the Narcissus family, daffodils are related to the Narcissus family. And um, things like snowdrops are what they're one of the early bloomers, so that. And species tulips. Uh, the regular tulips are just like candy for squirrels and rabbits, so I, I've tended to stay away from those and uh, switch to other alternatives. I, and what I found though, they may, uh, the squirrels with these species that are related to onions, they may uh, chip talk, bite, <laughs> couldn't find my word, uh, bite one of them off, but they don't go and demolish all of them. So you may lose some uh, to that. Plant, the, plant your bulbs a couple inches deeper than is recommended. The, the squirrel uh, will give up digging after a bit. And there is a product now called ActiSol, which is spelled A-C-T-I hyphen S-O-L, hen manure. So it does a couple of things because manure is a fertilizer, uh, but it's actually got some... Um, something in it that repels the squirrels. So you do need to put that down um, on top of the ground um, in the fall and again in the spring um, when the, the soil starts to um, thaw. Um, the other thing to do is make it like look where you planted your bulbs, make it look you, like you were never there. So smooth it down. And you can also add a little layer of mulch over there too. So these are some examples of bulbs. I just wanted to mention for new gardeners, bulbs are planted with the pointy end up. Um, some of them may be hard to tell, but they, the, the opposite end usually has little tiny hairs. They call it a plate. Uh, so, but a lot of them are pointed. So you try to plant them with the pointy side up. On the packages, they will give you the recommended depth um, and they also give you the spacing. So whether you should plant them two inches apart or three inches, you know, the bigger the bulb, the further apart it is basically. The smaller the bulb, the it looks nicer if it's in a small cluster. So this is an example on the left here. This is an example of a species tulip. Uh, that the squirrels do leave alone. It's one of the first thing, th first tulips to bloom. And uh, the little snowdrops, they can push through the ground in late February, March, and they're always, there's always a delight. They come double as well as uh, single. So this on the left-hand side, the tall ones are an example of the alliums. You can get them in white as well. You can get short ones, you can get red ones, you can get ones that bloom early, ones that bloom later. The same can be said for tulip bulbs as well. They have early, mid and late blooming bulbs. So you can get a nice show depending on the space you have in your garden. Um, the one on the right is the frutillaria, the one that smells like a skunk. And you can see down here on the frutal area at the bottom, you can see the leaves. So it puts these leaves out and then sends up this big, beautiful shoot. Uh, and uh, same with um, the allium. Uh, daffodils do this as well. So after they're finished blooming, the leaves start to turn yellow, which is actually a good thing because the leaves, the nutrients out of the leaves are going down into the bulb for next year. So you want that to happen, but sometimes it doesn't look so nice. So uh, this gardener on the left, she's put a beautiful hosta there. So the hosta will come up later. Um, so it's just disguising the dead growth that's going on with her, with her uh, allium. Um. Uh, this is uh, an example. This is narcissus and daffodils mixed together. So there's all kinds of these. You'll, you can get them at the garden centers. Some of the um, grocery stores have them, the big um, hardware stores, or you can go online. There's lots of them. The one on the left here is a kind of lily. So again, that's in the onion family. This is a short foxtail lily and I, I really love this how it's been intermixed with the these look like peonies back here these pink things but they're actually a kind of tulip uh, that look like a peony and um, so anyway they um, um, it, this I think this is a stunning combination and the idea behind this was that the critters going in to look 
perhaps at your tulip, uh, may be put off by the, the fragrance or the odor of the, the lily family. The other thing you can do with bulbs is naturalize them. If you have um, a wood, um, you know, a large property, these are just holes dug in the ground and stick a bulb in. Uh, a lot is better than more so that you get the effect. You can do the same thing with daffodils. And these are bulbs that we call naturalized. So they will multiply. And where you put one next year, you'll see maybe three flowers. And then they keep going outward and going outward looking for uh, for nutrients. And that's how they spread. Um, the the um, hy hyacinth, not hyacinths, the crocus is here. Um, after these die down, they do let the lawn, they don't cut the lawn right away after the flowers are gone. They wait till the stems, uh, the leaves die down, and then they just cut this with a lawnmower. Uh, I just want to give a caution there. You may have seen some blue lawns. That's what I call them in the spring. Um, that is a bulb called a scilla, S-C-I-L-L-A. It's, it is a naturalizing bulb, uh, but it also spreads by seed and it's, uh, it is on our invasive species list now. So please try to stay away uh, from that. We don't want it getting into uh, our ravines and our, our nature areas. Uh, this, I just want to mention this is another technique for bulbs. So they have different levels and different types. So when, this is a just a slice through the middle of a circle. So it looks gorgeous when it comes up because you, you've got different things at different times, first of all, uh, or you, they could be all the same time. And then you have different uh, varieties. So it looks gorgeous um, coming up uh, through the bulbs. And... So this is your last chore, one of your last chores uh, is clean up your tools. So this is a good time to clean up your tools. Some people do this in the in the dead of winter, some of these. So uh, clean the rust off your shovel, uh, file a sharp edge on it. Um, your secateurs and other pruning tools, you sharpen them and uh, oil them. Um, your other tools, make sure they're clean. You may want to um, things like your shovels or your hose, you, depending on what they're made of. You may want to put some oil on those just to preserve them over the winter. Regarding your hose, so make sure you've drained your hose uh, with the freeze thaw, it can explode um, over the winter. Um, and if you have a turn off valve for your water, so depending on how old your house is, the older homes you had to make sure you turned your water off for that outspout downstairs someplace and let it drain. So if you have an older home, uh, check that. I, I have an older home, but we got a new um, a new shutoff valve that's in the wall. So I just have to, I can leave mine on all the time because it's the actual valve part is inside. So, um, so I think um, we are done our presentation. And I just want to mention, we're going to take some questions now. Hopefully Roman is back on here. I'm not sure. Uh, I've just been talking away, <laughs> so I hope it's been working. Uh, but anyway, we're going to take some questions now. I just wanted to let you know if we don't get a chance to get to all your questions or uh, we don't know the answer, <laughs> uh, hopefully we will. But anyway, um, you can go to our website, www.durhammastergardenersinfo.ca. Uh, and there is a spot there where you can ask questions. You can send us an email at info at durhammastergardeners.ca or we have a Facebook group, um, same name, and also the Master Gardeners of Ontario have um, a Facebook group. And that group now is, you can get a lot of good information on there. Uh, and there's, I think, like 25,000 members on the Master Gardeners of Ontario Facebook site. So a good place to go for advice. So now I'll turn it over to um, Anish to, um, and Roman, hopefully, to facilitate some questions. Thank you so Thank much, you so much. Roman. Um, Roman, I'm glad that you're back on. Um, we'll start with questions. We do have a few for folks who are still looking to ask your questions. questions please feel free once again to type them in the 
chat function and we'll make sure that they get answered. We do have a couple here, so let's begin with the first one. And I believe this might have been for Roman's part of the presentation. Do all inocula look the same? I'm just going to unmute, I unmute myself. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Perfect. Um, OK, uh, sorry about that. Something cut off. I, I think Microsoft Teams signed me out, so I really apologize, <laughs> especially Pam. You had to do it all by yourself almost. OK, do all inocular look the same? Um, the truth is we can't see them. Uh, we can't see them because they're barely visible to human eye. Um, spores look like powder and we just literally cannot see them at all. What we can see is a sign of inocula. So what's the difference between signs and symptoms? A sign is a visible manifestation of a pathogen, whether it's a virus, bacteria, um, or something else, for, for example, a fungus. A symptom is indirect. For example, plant behaves differently. You know, it's stunted, yellow, dry. Um, that's a symptom. So basically what we're looking at, we're looking at signs of a disease on a leaf. That's pretty much what it is. And if I'm correct, if, I, if I'm correctly answering, targeting this question, uh, you probably you're probably talking about different types of diseases that show different signs. And in this case, the answer is uh, no, they don't look the same. The signs do not look the same. Uh, the actual inoculum, you can't see them. So you, you're never going to see uh, a spore of a fungal disease in the air or on the on the plant or within the plant. It's just physically impossible for us humans to do so. What we do can see, what we can see, what we can see is a sign. It's a sign of a disease in form of uh, a black spot on a leaf. For example, Pam was just talking about it. Uh, or a powdery mildew, which is a fungal disease. Also, it affects many, many, many different plants. For example, a peony. At this time of the year, a lot of a lot of a lot of people can see that those leaves and stems going white, and and that's pretty much what you, what you can see. It's very easy to see if a plant is diseased, and why? It's easy to see if a plant is diseased. It's easy to see it because you see. Uh, a, a spot on the leaf, a spot or a different color on, on the stem. I hope this answers the question. So the answer is no, you can see the actual inoculum. Yes, you can see different size of signs of different, different uh, inocula. Thank you so much, Roman. The next question that we have here is, will we be talking about prepping vegetable gardens for the winter? As as, uh, as 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 far as I know, it's not a part of the presentation. Uh, Pam, am I right? We can't hear you, Pam. You have to unmute yourself. Pam, you may need to unmute yourself. Think you've got it? Okay. There we go. Yes. We okay. Can hear you. Okay. 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 Um, okay. Oh, you're unmuted again. Or sorry, you're muted again. You've got it now, I think. This, okay. We can hear you. 
Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Me and technology. <laughs> okay, so I'm sorry, we did not specifically um, talk about vegetable garden. Uh, however, I have a small, I have a vegetable garden. So I guess it, it part of the answer in gardening is depends. So it depends on things that you're growing there. So if you're growing dill and horseradish, you may want to harvest the dill. So uh, any herbs like that, you would want to harvest. Um, um, the dill so it doesn't go all over. The, the horseradish you can just leave because it'll get, uh, the top will die, but the roots will stay. The same with if you have rhubarb in your garden, the roots will stay. Um, carrots will take several frost hits before they actually freeze. So they're one of the, if you're growing carrots, they're one of the things you can harvest uh, later. Um, similar to turnip, for instance, you could harvest later. Uh, tomatoes, I touched on a bit. So tomatoes, once they get, once we get a frost, um, they'll go to mush, even though they look okay for a couple of days. Uh, after that, they go to mush. So you're, um, when you hear, watch the weather forecast for your area and you can um, uh, harvest your tomatoes before then, just turn them and pick them green, uh, put them in a tray or some people wrap them in, in newspaper, as I said. Some people do um, cover some of their vegetables um, with uh, like a cloth or a towel or something like that to protect them a little longer if you've got some uh, vegetables coming on. So garlic and um, garlic and onions, I talked about those. So you can harvest those. Your potatoes, you can harvest if you haven't already uh, done so. So this may be a time where you want to maybe layer some, uh, depending on what your soil is. So there's another depend. If you've got really good soil, you might not need to do anything, right? Uh, but if things didn't go so well in your garden, you might want to um, uh, have a soil test, add some compost on the top, um, and just I would just leave it over winter and then work it in in the spring. So I hope those are some tips. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, we will give folks a couple more minutes to submit their questions if they have any. In the meantime. Oh, there's a question that's come through. Give me one second. Let's publish it. The question is. In this climate, will a brassica survive well? I don't know if I pronounced that properly. Okay, so those are very hardy and um, they will take some frost. So I'd have to consult each book, but I know like uh, things like uh, broccoli, um, cabbage, um, I think, I'm not sure about cauliflower, but I, I, I think so. But I, I wouldn't want to swear to that one without um, some of the kales too will uh, flourish. The cola rabbi, um, it will, uh, it can take the frost as well. So um, although mine did not do well this year uh, at all, but <laughs> anyway, uh, so yeah, they can take the, fr the frost. They won't go through the whole winter, though. Uh, kale, pretty hardy, depending on the on the the variety. I've seen some, you know, in December in the in the fields. Um, but um, yeah, sorry. Those are those are the only ones I know. I don't grow any of those myself. Sorry. Okay, we'll wait for some more questions to come in. In the meantime, I have a question. What is your favorite plant to look forward to in the springtime following the winter? For me, <laughs> I have two actually. I have snowdrops, which I love to see them come up. And I have my red bud tree, which is uh, Circus canadensis. It has the most beautiful pink flowers just it's like you glued a flower on every little piece of every little branch and it's just my my favorite absolute tree first of all and um, I guess next to snowdrops those are my two favorite how about you Ron? 
It's a very good question. <laughs> to be to be honest with you, um, Iris is like my favorite. I love uh, irises and I love the their amazing leaves. Uh, they're very sturdy, um, full of green, full of green pigment, and um, also the flowers. Uh, they usually come purple, uh, delicate blue, white. Those are my favorite. Beautiful flowers, wonderful. All right, thank you so much. Um, I don't see any further questions coming in yet. So, oh, Sylvia might have had a question. Yeah, I don't know if you guys could answer this question. Uh, so what do you guys recommend? Um, obviously, I have a tiny backyard and it's full of weeds. Is it better to just strip the whole lawn and then start resodding new grass or there's a hope that Grass could go, I guess, um, on top wow. of the weeds, or like, <laughs> how do you tackle weeds? Is my question. Well, I guess it really depends on how thick is the infestation. So, uh, it's like it, a jungle. It's like a jungle. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, if it, Okay, so if it is like a jungle, then um, you, I would suggest you start over. So you'd have to have somebody come and dig it. So um, yeah, yeah. there are lawn care companies that do that. Uh, the problem with what you're seeing as, as a jungle, some of those roots in the jungle can be very shallow. So that's not a big deal. You could just try pulling them out. Uh, but some of those roots have tap roots that that could go down a foot or more in your garden and depending on the type of weed too. So um, the other thing you could do is cover the whole thing over and make it, <laughs> you could just add mulch and more soil and make it one big garden. <laughs> like um, I showed that garden bed. Yep, I saw that. So yeah. that's an option too, right? But there are, there are lawn care companies that will come kind of rototill it they rake out all the weeds and everything and they leave it for like six weeks so i'm going to say this is maybe done better in the spring and um so i see it they leave it about six weeks then they go back again check for weeds and then they then they usually do sod it okay so do yeah, you don't so recommend i just like pour a bunch of seeds and it'll hopefully just push the weeds out that doesn't it's not that uh, easy. well <laughs> i guess it depends on what kind of weeds they are how dense oh. they are there might not be any soil um for the the grass seeds to get down to you'd have to do okay. a really good job of uh removing all at, at least at the very least remove all the top off the weeds okay yeah then you might see some soil um, and and then you could try the grass seed. Okay. All right, well, that's good to know. <laughs> I, I wish you guys There's could come over to my house and just help me out. <laughs> <laughs> it's, very, it's very difficult to maintain law and people say it's easy, but it, it's, it's not. It takes a lot of activities and tasks to complete in order to ensure beautiful law. And uh, that's why people get um, contractors, landscapers to do that. It's, it's, it's really, really hard. And you know what? There is nothing better than manual pulling, manual pulling of weeds. You just have to do it all manually, get a trowel, get a shovel, dig it out. In order to get that weed out, you just have to take the root out because unfortunately, if it's a perennial weed, it's, it will be growing back over and over again. So removing the top is effective uh, short term. Yeah, but if it's a perennial, it will grow back. Um, so yeah, Pam, that was a great advice. To um, to get rid of the weeds uh, manually, I would I would add digging it out with a travel or or a shovel, and uh, definitely any lawn reno. Uh, spring is a good time. Uh, if it comes to overseeding, I would uh, overseed in uh, in the fall. Uh, we can do it in the spring. Yes, the answer is yes. Someone would ask a question: Can we still do it in the spring? Yes, but it's not recommended, and that's because. What follows what does follow spring summer and summer that's pretty that's a pretty hot season, which means all those seeds if there's no irrigation system are going to struggle with the lack of water. They're not going to develop a deep root system, which means that uh, whatever biomass is on the top, in this case leaves of grasses uh, is going to reflect the size of the root. So uh, the poorer the root system you have on the bottom below the surface, uh, 
the worst looking the top of the grass is. So uh, any debris, hard soil, um, hidden under the surface of the grass can affect it. The, uh, the other thing I'll just mention, if you are thinking of digging them out, I think it's supposed to rain all day tomorrow. So the following day, the soil will be softer. So it's always good to weed after a rainy day. Oh, okay. <laughs> and what's the best grass to, I guess, put back on? Or like, is there a, a brand or a type of grass that would be like that green, lush, soft, you know, grass? What is that grass called? <laughs> well, there's all different kinds. Yeah. OK, so there's not one specific. Yeah, sorry. There is a, um, sorry, there is, um, it depends on your site. It depends on your soil. Uh, if it's really hot and sunny or if it's shady, there's different kinds of grass that you can get, different blends. Um, so is it a shady site? Is it a sunny, sunny <laughs> site? Uh, in the morning, it's uh, sunny, but in the afternoon, it's shady. Yeah, so something I've used on my lawn is uh, an echo. It's called echo lawn. It's a seed that uh, is slow growing. It's good in the shade. It's good in the sun. I only have to cut it uh, for every three times I cut the rest, the other pieces of my lawn, I only have to cut this piece once. The disadvantage of it is though that it takes a couple of years for it to start looking really nice. So if you've got the patience, um, that that type of uh, um, grass is something I would recommend. So echo, E-C-H-O? Uh, yeah, I think it's just like echo, like yodel or okay. whatever. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly how you spell it, but um, that's something you can look at. Okay, thank you. Wonderful. All right. I think this brings us to the end. I don't see any further questions. Thank you so very much, Pam and Roman, for joining us this evening. Um, lots of wonderful, wonderful content. Um, I learned a lot myself, which is exciting. I'll be out there in my garden <laughs> over the weekend, hopefully. <laughs> we want to come and see your garden next year. <laughs> yeah, it's a work in progress. We'll, we'll, we'll... Everybody, every gardener's garden is a work in progress. <laughs> Makes sense. That's, what, that's why they say gardeners never grow old, because we're always looking forward. Ah, that's a fantastic uh, <laughs> saying. I'm going to remember that one. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time and thank you for all our viewers who joined us this evening. Um, we do have a number of other webinars as part of these as part of this series. Uh, you can absolutely sign up and register on our event right page. And that brings us to the end. Thank I you. I think there's much. another question. Oh, sure. <laughs> oh, no, I'm just, it says, I have a new service berry plant. Is it enough to mulch for the winter? A new serve. Oh, I love service berries. They're one of my favorite. Uh, okay, so a couple of things you want to do is, uh, yes, you can mulch around the root zone, maybe three or four inches because it's newly planted, but remember the water thing. So remember to keep it watered. Like if we go into a dry spell, keep it watered, okay, until it frees up. And enjoy, you'll love that. Now I want to serve a spare plant. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you, uh, Sylvia, for catching that last question. Totally missed it. Yeah, no worries. All right. Now this brings us to the actual end of tonight. <laughs> Thank you very much. Both <laughs> really appreciate your time and your um, presentation tonight. Good. Well, thank you for inviting us. We appreciate it. It was a pleasure to be here and share. Thank you.